Hello everyone, welcome to Scardia.com. This is Dr. Sana Khan with the General Surgery course. Today we are going to discuss a very important topic which is uh, very much seen in the hospital environment that it's, that's about the burns. In today's lecture, I'm going to give you introduction about the burns, then we're going to talk about the pathophysiology, what is the mechanism of the burns, and then we're going to talk about the sequel of the burn that uh, actually comprises that how uh, the peripheral and the central nervous system and the most vital organs like the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, and then the gastrointestinal system is being affected uh, by the burns. Then we're going to talk about the types of the burns, uh, which are basically we divide it into a superficial and the deep thickness burns. And then these uh, superficial and the deep thickness burns, they are further divided into, uh, into the full thickness and a partial thickness. And then we're going to talk about uh, the management of the burns. Like we're, we're going to start from the site of uh, the scene where actually the burn happen and then we're going to talk about the pre-hospital care and then uh, the hospital management and the definitive uh, management which comprises of medical treatment as well as the surgical treatment so in today's uh, lecture we're going to cover all these aspects Regarding the epidemiology and the statistical data of, uh, uh, of United Kingdom, we actually know that almost there is a population of 60 million people. And out of these 65 million people, uh, almost 1,75,000 of the people report to the accident emergency with the burns. Now, if we talk about this 1,75,000 of the people, almost 30,000 of the people are uh, those patients who would be requiring the admissions. And out of that 13,000, almost 1,000 of the people would be with the swear uh, burn injuries who would be requiring fluid resuscitation and the definitive injury. So we can see that there is a great burden of um, burned patient in overall accident and emergency like almost 13,000 of the people would be uh, with the swear burn injuries and they would be needing the hospital uh, treatment and admission and out of that almost thousand people thousand of the patient would be requiring uh, fluid resuscitation they would be requiring a definitive surgery and if we further go into the statistics uh, we can also appreciate that almost 50 percent of the patients which are reported to the accident emergency, uh, they are um, children, and mostly they are the teenagers and the children. This age group is uh, being more vulnerable, and they are mostly 16, uh, less than 16 years. And almost uh, this population, the children and the teenagers, they compromise about 50% uh, of the population or the patients who are being reported to the accident and emergency. So this is the overall uh, epidemiological data which is uh, being recorded so far when we talk about the statistics of uh, the bird patients in the United Kingdom. Now regarding the mode of injury, uh, we have different causes when we talk about the children and then we have different causes when we talk about the adults. In most uh, patients or in most of, most of the cases, children usually they have those skull injuries because of uh, maybe the hot water or maybe the hot liquids and uh, uh, most of the time the injuries are in the form of the skulls. Now, it can be uh, with the uh, hot water, it can be because of hot beverages or a kettle injury or maybe because of um, a touch injury because uh, to the uh, iron. Now, if we talk about the adults, so mostly they are in a setup, uh, their matchstick injuries uh, would, would be common. Then there can be inflammable uh, uh, liquids, uh, uh, like they're working uh, in industrial states where there would be flammable liquids and uh, that would result in the burn injury. The other modes which comprises, uh, they are the electrical and the chemical injuries, um, like if we talk about the electricians and those people who are working in a chemical setup or large industrial uh, setup. So there can be mechanical, chemical and electrical injuries that can result in burns. 
There can be some radiation injuries and uh, there can be cold uh, injuries as well. Like uh, when we talk about uh, the, the, uh, mostly the patients or the people who are working uh, high up in the mountains and there can be frostbite injuries and they can also result in, their, uh, in the burn injury. So this is the mode of the uh, injury. When we talk about children, mostly they have the cold injuries because of the hot water or the beverages or the cattle injuries. And in case of the children, uh, we have... Uh, 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 injuries which are related to their workplaces most of the time, like if they are um, electrically or uh, chemically acquiring the burn, or there can be radiation, there can be matchstick injury, or they can be they're working actually with the flammable uh, liquids. And there can be uh, diseases which are reported in a psychiatric patients, like there can be a mental disease, there can be epilepsy, there can be alcohol abuse. So all these um, actually comprise about 80% um, uh, of the disorders, they actually result in any kind of the burn injury. Now, if we talk about the pathophysiology, we have... Uh, there is particularly, we have um, divided it into three broad base categories. One injury to the airway, the other is the metabolic poisoning, and the third category is about the inhalation injury. Now we'll be discussing it one by one. Uh, what do you mean by injury to the airway? So when we talk about the injury to the airway, so actually the patient uh, who is coming to you in your um, uh, ER and he's having a facial puffiness and there would be swelling, or you can see that uh, the hair actually burn and you can see this whole of the swelling of the face or uh, there would be laryngeal edema as well. So there can be, uh, you can, uh, in such patients, you can actually suspect that there is uh, uh, injury to the airway which is involving the face and the neck. All the injuries uh, which uh, are involving face and the neck region, they you should always, always suspect that there is injury to the airway, right? So when we talk about the airway, there's an upper airway and then there is a lower airway. So when we talk about the upper airway, it's absolutely uh, above the pharynx. And then you have uh, the subglottic and the supraglottic airways. So most of the time, uh, the injury to the supra and the subglottic airway that could result in, in uh, the in edema and the patient actually can present to you in uh, with the strider with the voice difficulty with the uh, actually respiratory difficulty so you can suspect that there is injury to the airway now there is another uh, category which is injury to the lower airway like um, you know it's a it's mostly uh, laryngeal, uh, uh, it's below the pharynx, so it's mostly the laryngeal injury, so which is actually rare, but it can, uh, it can, uh, it can be a sequel of the burn injury. There is another mechanism we talk about like metabolic poisoning. This uh, is particularly important in uh, the patients who are, uh, who, ha who have acquired a burn injury in a closed space, like we know, that as a result of the burn, there is um, there is a more and more production of the carbon monoxide, and we know that carbon monoxide that has actually uh, almost. 240 times affinity uh, um, that of the oxygen, right? So what happens is like it has more of the tendency to bind up with the oxygen, uh, with actually displace the oxygen, and it is uh, more of the time it is uh, in, uh, it is binding to the RBCs. So what happens is that when actually the carbon monoxide, which is being produced as a result of a combustion, so what happens is that this carbon monoxide, it displaces the oxygen because it, is a, it has 240 uh, times more affinity as compared to the oxygen uh, to the uh, RBCs that are hemoglobin. So what happens is a carboxyhemoglobin is being produced. So this carboxyhemoglobin, what happens is like it would decrease the affinity of the oxygen and there would be reduced and reduced and reduced uh, oxygen available to the uh, tissues. So that is a term which is called as a metabolic poisoning. Uh, most of the time it's carbon monoxide but in some cases there is a production of hydrogen cyanide as well. Now, when we talk about the carbon monoxide, uh, you should always and always suspect uh, metabolic poisoning in those patients who are actually reporting to you and they're giving you the history that they are, they have been enclosed in a closed space because there would be more of the uh, combustion and there would be more chances that there would be production of the carbon monoxide. 
the carbon monoxide is actually a silent killer, okay? So it freezes uh, the metabolic responses, it decreases the oxygen delivery to the tissues, and as a result of that, uh, the patient uh, would be actually, um, uh, actually would be found in uh, altered sensorium or actually would be found in um, unconscious state. So that's a metabolic poisoning. The other thing we, we talk about is hydrogen cyanide. So hydrogen cyanide is actually, uh, it uh, interferes with the mitochondrial respiration. So we know that at the cellular level, uh, ATP are being generated by the mitochondria. So what happens is like uh, when there is uh, more and more production of the hydrogen cyanide, so this hydrogen cyanide actually interferes at the mitochondrial level and it interferes with the respiration and that results in, um, you know, uh, the poisoning and then patient usually report to you in unconscious states. And uh, if the only treatment in case of the metabolic poisoning, like uh, if you're suspecting carbon monoxide poisoning, at least pure oxygen should be delivered to the patient for at least 24 hours. 100% uh, oxygen should be delivered uh, for 24 hours. That is, in that case, there would be uh, survival, there would be chances of the survival of the patient. So only um, definitive treatment for the patient who has uh, who have developed metabolic poisoning as a result of burn injury or a combustion so um, uh, pure 100 percent oxygen should be delivered to such patient now we also talk about uh, another uh, category that was about the inhalation injury so when we talk about the inhalation injury that means actually uh, that is a chemical alveolitis. We know that there are small, tiny particles uh, which are produced uh, as, a result, as a result of combustion or these particles actually they're present in the smoke. So when these particles, they are ingested, they go down all the way to trachea and then they go down all the way to bronchioles and then to the alveoli. So when they actually go to the alveoli, they uh, interfere with the diffusion. We know that the diffusion and a transfer and exchange of the carbon dioxide and oxygen takes place actually at the alveolar level. So when there would be chemical alveolitis, uh, and then what happened that there would be decrease in the diffusion capacity, there would be decrease in the exchange of the gases, and then the patient would uh, eventually the, uh, uh, develop a respiratory failure. So um, these three modes of actions, which are very, very much important when you are considering a patient who's coming to you uh, with burn injury, especially the uh, areas like face and head and neck and these areas, there are more, uh, there is a chance that there would be more, um, uh, uh, you know, path, uh, there is more uh, inhalation injury and there is more chance of the uh, injury to the upper or a lower airway. So in that case, as first, if you're suspecting a carbon monoxide poisoning, you should deliver 100% oxygen. But in case you, uh, you are suspecting an inhalation injury or you are suspecting that there's injury to the upper or lower airway, then early intubation uh, should be uh, provided to that patient so that later on, you should uh, avoid uh, the respiratory failure of the patient. We'll talk about the definitive uh, management in the coming section. But uh, regarding the pathophysiology, all these Three mechanisms are very, very much important when you are uh, attending a patient who is coming to you in your ER with the burns. Now, regarding the inflammatory process, actually, what does the burn do to your body? We know that as a result of the burn injury, there would be release of the inflammatory cytokines. And these inflammatory cytokines, uh, actually, they activate the complement system. And what does the complement system actually do? There would be more and more um, attraction and there would be more uh, mast cells coming to the field of the burn. There would be more and more uh, neutrophils coming to that particular field. And uh, these actually uh, inflammatory cytokines also activate the Hagman factor, which actually uh, can also result uh, in the release of the neuropeptides. So what would happen that there is a burn, then there, there would be a release of the inflammatory cytokines. These cytokines will actually then uh, will activate the complement system. It can activate the Hagman system and it's going to release more and more of the neuropeptides. Now, the complement system. What does a complement activation of the complement system does? It actually leads to the degranulation of the mast cells 
and uh, there would be uh, more and more uh, infiltration and activation of the neutrophils as well. And then there would be coding of the proteins, which would actually uh, alter the uh, structure and function of the proteins. Now, when uh, proteins are structurally altered, their function would be altered as well, and they would release uh, they would actually, um, uh, there would be more and more uh, free oxidative radicals released by the neutrophils. Now, overall, there is a degranulation of the mast cells, the structure and function of the protein is being altered, and then there is generation of the free oxidative radicals. All of these lead to the chemotaxis. There would be altered permeability, and then there would be damage to the collagen itself. Now, what actually this uh, alteration, the permeability does? Now, what happens is like when there is uh, most of the time uh, all the proteins and uh, they can actually uh, pass from intravascular to the extravascular space. So what happens is like if there is alteration in the permeability, uh, so most of the proteins would be leaked from the intravascular space to the extravascular space. The uh, proteins will actually decrease the oncotic pressure, uh, the filtration, and more and more filtration and shifting of the proteins from intravascular space to the extravascular space that actually decrease the oncotic pressure. Now, when there, are in, uh, decrease, there would be decrease in the oncotic pressure, more of the fluid would be uh, would be moving out. From the, extra, from the intravascular space to the extravascular space. So that is why there would be a shifting uh, of the proteins and there would be shifting of the uh, cellular water in the cellular comp uh, component. And then there would be um, tissue edema. So all these things which actually result in uh, the uh, damage of the collagen and the changes in the permeability and the chemotaxis and uh, the net result would be the tissue edema and more and more injury and a vicious cycle that would be uh, going on. If we go back, uh, we already talked about that there would be a complement system activation. There would be release of the neuropeptides and there would be activation of the Hagman factor as well. We talk about the complement system, uh, degranulation of the mast cells and then uh, free oxidative uh, radicals. Now, if we talk about the Hagman factor, what is the Hagman factor? Uh, does. It actually increases the protease driven cascade. So uh, because of that, the overall effect would be again the same. Uh, chemotaxis, changes in the permeability, and then uh, damage to the uh, collagen, right? So all these factors, the Hagman, uh, the complement, and neuropeptides, free oxidative radicals, and the mast cells, all result would be chemotaxis, permeability change, vascular damage, collagen damage, and that will, would result in the tissue edema. Now that's how the inflammatory process will result in the burn injury. Now if we go back to the previous slide, we already talked about that there would be release of the neuropeptides as well. Now actually these neuropeptides will ultimately, release of these neuropeptides will ultimately be reaching to the same thing, which is chemotaxis, permeability change, and uh, collagen damage. So what happens is like I have already explained uh, what happens when there is a change of permeability. Shift of the fluid and shift of the proteins from intravascular space to the extravascular space. So that will lead to the generation of the tissue edema. And there would be increase in the oncotic pressure in, uh, there would be a decrease in the oncotic pressure in intravascular oncotic pressure would be decreased, but in the extravascular space at the site of the burn injury, the oncotic pressure would be it would be increased because there would be shifting of proteins uh, from inside to outside. That is from the intravascular compartment to the extravascular compartment. So the, in the extravascular compartment, the oncotic pressure would be increased, uh, fluid uh, shift would be there, there would be tissue edema, and because of that uh, shift in the fluid, uh, the patient can actually report to you in a circulatory shock. Now what happens, uh, 
uh, almost if 10 to 15 percent of the TBSA has been uh, involved in a burn injury. So that would actually be resulting into a circulatory shock and more than 60 percent of the TBSA would definitely would be resulting in uh, a circulatory shock. So that's how uh, the proteins, the shift of the vascular uh, compartment and cardiac pressure, fluid, uh, these all uh, can uh, result in the inflammatory process and the patient can actually develop a circulatory shock. That's why it's very, very important uh, to assess uh, how much of the uh, surface area uh, is burned. And then you have to uh, resuscitate uh, the patient with the fluids so that he doesn't uh, develop circulatory shock. And if he's already into a circulatory shock, you have to resuscitate uh, the patient to actually um, keep him out of the shock. So uh, again, uh, this is the whole uh, summary. We will talk about the inflammatory process. I'm not gonna go repeat it because it's almost the same thing. Uh, what you have to keep in mind is uh, the um, release of the neuropeptides, free oxidative radicals, and ultimately uh, the pressure changes, the narcotic pressure changes, the shift of the volumes, and uh, then the development of the circulatory shock. Because actually the treatment uh, depends upon on uh, this thing. If the patient is in already in a circulatory shock, you have to replace the fluids uh, accordingly. And if he is going to develop a circulatory shock, then prophylactically, you should rehydrate the patient so that he doesn't develop a circulatory shock. Now we're going to talk about uh, the sequelae of burn, uh, what actually uh, manifestation uh, burn is doing to the different systems of the body. So when we talk about the immune uh, system, we already know that there is activation of the neutrophils, there would be activation and the degranulation of the mast cells. So number one thing is the activation of the immune system. The other thing is that there would be changes to the intestine. We talked about that there would be hypoperfusion. Why there would be hypoperfusion? Because there would be uh, tissue edema at the site of the injury and uh, because of uh, the oncotic pressure changes and alter in the permeability. So because of that, the fluid would be shifting from the intravascular compartment to the extravascular compartment, specifically at the site of the injury uh, initially. So because of that, uh, there would be hyperperfusion. Uh, the patient would be in circulatory shock. So uh, when the patient would be in circulatory shock, there would be hyperperfusion of the different organs, which involves uh, the intestines and which can uh, be involved in the kidneys as well. So when you talk about the changes to the intestine because of the hyperperfusion, there is a possibility that there would be gut ischemia. Now, because of the gut ischemia, uh, there would be uh, hypo uh, mortality, or there would you can say that there would be decreased uh, mortality, and because of that. Uh, there is more and more contamination and um, because more um, uh, stagnant uh, bacteria would be there. So there is the possibility of more and more infections. So in case of the changes to the intestine, uh, so there is hyperperfusion, there is gut ischemia, and there would be uh, um, a decrease in mortality as well. So because of all these uh, changes, uh, the integral route for the absorption of the fluid and for the absorption of the um, nutrients uh, would be decreased. So that's why you would be putting your patient on uh, NG tube or uh, feeding, or you would be giving in the form of the IV uh, um, like intravenous or parental or total parental nutrition as well. So we talk about changes to uh, intestine, which include gut ischemia, and there would be microvascular damage, and all these things will definitely uh, be uh, resulting in uh, hyperperfusion injuries, and then there would be, uh, because of the circulatory shock, you have to resuscitate your patient, and then you have to shift your patient from enteral uh, route uh, to the uh, parenteral route, or maybe a total parenteral uh, route, uh, and because... Um, 
because you are actually um, resuscitating uh, your patients so you have to uh, keep in mind that they can be injury that uh, in case of the hyperperfusion there can be injury to the kidneys as well so the fluid resuscitation is very much important and then you have to uh, monitor if the resuscitation is sufficient or not so you will catheterize your patient and you will uh, check for the uh, hourly uh, urine output that should be ranging between 0.5 ml to 1 ml per kg body weight per hour so that's the sequel of the burn and uh, there can be danger uh, to the peripheral circulation as well because i have already discussed the patient would be in circulatory shock so the peripheral circulation would be compromised so that is why uh, fluid resuscitation and you know ng feeding is very very much important in a patient uh, who is uh, suffering from a burn now, if we talk about uh, the types of the burns, uh, so we broadly classify these into superficial and the deep burns, and then we classify into partial thickness burn or a full thickness burn. So there are, you know, there are um, so many uh, ways to classify the burn. Uh, one is entirely depending upon uh, the thickness, and the other can be uh, because of the uh, depending upon the depth of the burn, or you can say that depending upon the site, if uh, there is a burn to the facial burn, or you can say uh, burn involving the upper limb or a lower limb, there is another classification system. So, but, but most commonly, we uh, classify on the basis of uh, the depth. So superficial thickness and the deep thickness, which is also called as partial thickness burn or a full thickness burn. Now, if we say uh, broadly uh, categorizing this, uh, if there is involvement of epidermis, okay, so that would be a superficial uh, burn, just confining to the epidermis. But uh, if there is involvement of dermis as well, so that would be a deep thickness burn. Now, if you could appreciate here in this diagram, we have uh, three different layers of the skin. One is called as epidermis, the other is called as a dermis, and the third layer is called as hypodermis. So the superficial uh, you know, a uh, superficial burn would be involving epidermis. So superficial partial thickness burn would be involving uh, epidermis along with the papillary dermis, a part of the dermis as well. So that, that's why we call it a superficial partial thickness burn, right? And then we have uh, the uh, other, which is called as a, a deep thickness burn, and it is comprising of epidermis as well as the reticular dermis as well. And the full thickness burns, they compromise uh, the uh, they comprises of the hypodermis as well. So broadly categorizing, uh, we have the partial thickness burn. You can see here, this is epidermis, and this is uh, also involving the papillary part of the dermis. Uh, you, you can say the upper layer of the dermis, which is called the papillary dermis. So that's a partial thickness burn. And the full thickness burn would be comprising uh, the all the layers, epidermis, uh, papillary, reticular, and the hypodermis as well. Again, this is the same thing. We have broadly categorized it into partial thickness burn and uh, uh, full thickness burn. So the partial would be superficial partial and a deep partial. Superficial partial would be comprising of uh, uh, the epidermis and a papillary layer of dermis, while the deep, uh, you know, partial thickness would be uh, in uh, would be involving the reticular layer of the dermis as well, and then. You have the full thickness, which is involving uh, all uh, the three layers, epidermis, dermis, and the full thickness would be involving the hypodermis as well. So superficial partial would be a first degree burn, deep partial would be a second degree burn, uh, then full thickness is divided into third degree burn and four degree burn. So you can see here, go back if you could, uh, it's, this is a superficial partial, which is involving uh, the epidermis, right? mostly uh, the epidermis. Now, if you could see here in the second degree burn, uh, some part of the epidermis and the uh, re reticular dermis is also involved. So this is a deep partial or you can say deep uh, second uh, degree burn. Third degree burn would be involving the whole of the uh, epidermis. 
the both the layers of the dermis one is the papillary dermis and a reticular dermis that says a third degree burn so you can say epidermis and dermis and a full thickness burn would be involving the hypodermis as well and then it's all also involving the vascular co component maybe involvement of the tendons and the muscles and it, it it is actually reaching till the bone so that's called as a four degree burn or also called as a full thickness burn now there's a classification system which is called as a Wagen and Bagel uh, classification system, which are which we are which most of the time we are using uh, to classify the burn wound. So we already talk about superficial, superficial partial thickness. We talk about the deep partial thickness, and then we already talk about the full thickness. So this would be the first degree. Uh, superficial partial thickness would be second degree. Deep partial thickness would be third degree, and uh, full thickness would be four degree burn. Uh, we will be talking about the dermal layers in walls. So we talk about the superficial, it's epidermis only. In uh, superficial partial, there is uh, upper one third of the dermis, like we talk about the papillary dermis. So epidermal plus papillary layer is superficial partial. In deep partial, it's epidermis and all the dermis, like reticular dermis, papillary dermis, and epidermis. And in full thickness, it is epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue, and it may involve bones and the tendons and the muscles as well. Now, if we talk about the characteristics, there would be a differentiation in all these categories depending upon their characteristic features. So in superficial, there's only erythematous desquamation. There's a dry, uh, flaky appearance. But in a superficial, uh, partial thickness, there would be painful blisters, there's minimal scar formation, edema, and uh, in this, uh, there, uh, the, 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 actually, uh, there is, the sensory uh, system is actually intact, okay? So, um, if you try to uh, blanch, it's a, it's a blanchable blister, okay? So, uh, in a superficial partial thickness, most uh, heal by a scar formation, and you actually don't require any kind of surgery. In deep partial thickness, it's a red waxy, um, and uh, most of the nerve tissues are also involved, they're also gone, so because of that, sensory uh, part is also damaged so there would be reduced pain uh, and uh, there is a star formation as well and uh, most of the time the blister formation is actually in the superficial partial thickness but uh, deep partial thickness in which uh, which is actually a mixed uh, thickness burn that can actually have the blister formation as well and in full thickness it's a bloodless pure wide and hair is easily plugged and there's a star formation as well now if we talk about healing Superficial burns usually heal in three to five days. Uh, superficial partial thickness, there is a minimal scar formation. In deep partial thickness, uh, the scar formation is uh, definitely more uh, than the superficial partial thickness. And because of that, uh, the healing process may take uh, two to three weeks. And uh, full thickness is uh, most of the time they have a sharp formation. And uh, because uh, in that, uh, the healing is actually, um, it takes quite a long time and it, it requires almost uh, surgical intervention like a steroid and sometimes it may require uh, grafting as well. So that's how um, we are uh, classifying the burn wounds depending upon the dermal layer, their characteristics, their healing time, the blister formation, scar formation, uh, and that's the most uh, widely acceptable classification system, which are uh, usually uh, it's being practiced in our uh, clinical practice. So far, we have uh, discussed about uh, the pathophysiology and the sequelae of the burn. Then we also talk about the different types of the burn. Now we are uh, going to discuss the most important part of the lecture, which is regarding the management of the burn. So uh, we have uh, divided uh, the management in actually three categories. One is the immediate care of the burn. The second is uh, late a stage in which you have to assess uh, the burn, and then you have a definitive treatment care. Now regarding the immediate care of the burn, it's actually starting from the pre-hospital uh, care and pre-hospital assessment and uh, the initial, you know, the initial first aid response uh, uh, that should be provided to a burn uh, patient. Then 
and the hospital premises, uh, how you are going to assess uh, the depth of the uh, burn and the size of the burn, and then which also uh, comprises the, um, you know, the resuscitation and the fluids, and then the, there is another category which is actually the definitive uh, treatment uh, plan for the burn. Now, if we talk about the immediate care of the burn, uh, I've already discussed that you have to go for um, the pre-hospital care, then you have a hospital care, and in the pre-hospital care, first of all is that you have to ensure the safety of the uh, patient, okay? First, the rescuer safety and uh, the patient safety. So it's actually starting uh, from uh, the evacuating uh, the patient uh, from the, from the say, from the burn uh, scene. Uh, the victim is being moved from uh, the premises, uh, and then he is. Uh, then also you have to stop, drop, and roll. That's actually the stopping the burning process, right? So what happens is like uh, in stopping the burning process, you have to limitize the damage. What what? However, the damage is already done. Obviously, you have to treat that, but still you have to uh, stop the ongoing damage. And uh, for that, you have a rule to follow, which is stop, uh, drop, and then roll. That's how uh, you should be evacuating uh, the patient from the burn scene. Then uh, you have to check for the other injuries as well. Obviously, if there is a burn injury, and we already talked in the start of the lecture regarding the inhalation injury, we talked about the airway injury, especially the... Uh, injuries and burn which are involving the face and the upper airway and the head and the neck region so there is a possibility more and more possibility of the inhalation injury and there's a more possibility of the uh, airway damage so you have to check for the uh, inhalation and the airway injuries and then you have also uh, to check about the other injuries is like uh, involvement of the upper limb and the lower limb the abdomen the chest because sometimes when there is a full thickness burn, uh, deep thickness or a full thickness burn involving the chest and there is the ischar formation. So what happens is like there is a hindrance in the rib movements. So because of that, uh, the, obviously the respiratory pattern of the patient would be compromised and the patient would end up in a respiratory failure. Uh, then you have to cool the burn wound. This is very, very important because it actually minimizes uh, the severity and the extent of the damage. Uh, so uh, the, uh, just uh, the most important and the first aid uh, step which you have to take is like cooling the burn wound. Then, uh, so we talk about in a pre-hospital care, ensure the safety of the patient, safety of the victim, and the rescuer safety, stopping the burning process, check for in, uh, checking for the other injuries, and uh, if there is, um, you know, there is availability, you have to extinguish the fire, you have to cool the burn wound, uh, giving oxygen is very important, especially in uh, the uh, in the environment in which there is the patient has uh, obtained or gained the injury in case of a cold space uh, closed space so what happens is that there is a metabolic poisoning hydrogen cyanide and carbon monoxide poisoning so you have to give a supplemental oxygen and if uh, most of the time the rescuers uh, they have the oxygen uh, uh, cylinders with them so giving uh, the hundred percent pure oxygen if they have it is uh, very much uh, beneficial if it is uh, given in the early stages uh, so that the inhalation and the effects of the inhalation and uh, the airway uh, injuries that can be minimized as well. Then elevation is very much important. Like if uh, the patient is lying supine and is a, is a burn victim, then what you have to do is like you have to elevate. You have to um, uh, elevate and flex uh, the neck. That's that's also uh, important because uh, that's gonna you know minimize uh, the effect of uh, the respiratory failure and obviously that would uh, help the patient uh, to uh, breathe efficiently. So that's uh, how you are going to provide a pre-hospital care. Now regarding the hospital care. A uh, very much important uh, thing is a primary survey. Whenever a trauma patient or whenever uh, a patient who is, uh, you know, um, who has acquired the burn or has been, been a burn victim, you have to um, make him go through a primary survey. So primary survey includes A, B, C, D, E. Uh, 
uh, there is another element which is F, but in most that's um, um, in most of the trauma patients we do A B C D E. Uh, A stands for airway. So starting from the airway, you have to check if the airway is patent or not. I have already told you that in case of the face and the head and neck injuries, there is a possibility of damage to the airway inhalation injury. So you. I have to check if the patient patient's airway is patent or not. Uh, like maybe there's a foreign body or, you know, there the patient is actually airway is not patent. There's an elation injury. So you have to, uh, you know, just um, elevate the head, chin the lift and uh, provide mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing to the patient if you are uh, actually um, you're actually finding the patient in an unconscious state or altered sensorium then breathing uh, breathing is very much important mouth-to-mouth -mouth breaths or sometimes you have to um, pass uh, the endotracheal uh, tube and in case of uh, when there's lots and lots of laryngeal edema and it's difficult uh, for you to intubate the patient you should have emergency uh, phrecothyroidotomy uh, should be performed in such cases in which ETT cannot be passed because of the large um, laryngeal edema and significant inhalation injury. Then circulation is very important. Uh, why circulation is important? If you go back uh, uh, to, to, to the lecture, we talked about the circulatory shock, right? Uh, we, talk, we talk about that the circulatory shock develops actually as a result of the decrease in the oncotic pressure and the fluid shifting from intravascular to the extravascular compartment. Uh, so uh, obviously all these things and um, uh, free oxidative radicals and release of the neuropeptides, they already uh, lead to uh, the circulatory shock. So it's very much important uh, to check for the pulse of the patient, check for the central and the peripheral pulses. If uh, the extremities are cold and peripheral pulses are feeble, and patient is tachycardic and extremities are cold, that means that the patient is actually in a circulatory shock. So in case of that, you have to start resuscitating your patient. Disability. Now, disability is uh, most of the time, uh, of, uh, you know, related to the central nervous system, right? So that means that may a patient uh, might have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, other injuries uh, with the burn injury. Maybe he was trying to escape um, from the burn site and he acquired the head injury. So the patient is on altar or maybe a metabolic poisoning that result in uh, the de depressive state or uh, the uh, loss of consciousness of the patient. So checking for this disability or a spinal injury uh, is very much important. Then environmental factors, uh, like maybe uh, he was, uh, it was a closed, uh, the, the, the burn uh, process was in a closed space or uh, in um, the open air, that's important. The environmental, ex environmental factors are important. Plus he also stands for exposure. So you have to expose the patient. Maybe uh, the patient is a burn, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a victim of the burn and you could only appreciate that there are uh, uh, burn, uh, you know, there are wounds on the uh, chest and the front of the chest, the limbs, but you're not exposing the patient. Maybe there is a, a superficial or partial thickness or deep thickness burn at the backside. So it's very much important to expose your patient. The fluid resuscitation, it's a very important uh, component of the uh, of the uh, this ABCDE regimen, uh, which is actually the primary survey. So fluid resuscitation, why is it important? Because we already talked, the patient uh, might be in a circulatory shock, or if you do not resuscitate your patient efficiently, and uh, you do not resuscitate your patient enough, so it might be possible that in the later stages, he would be developing a circulatory shock. So uh, in, in if the patient uh, is in a shock state, uh, his, uh, there would be gut ischemia, intestines would be compromised, and there would be a vicious cycle uh, involving the different uh, systemic uh, systemic uh, processes. And maybe there is uh, SIRS would be developed, the patient may develop sepsis, bacteremia. So all these things are important. So whenever you're providing a hospital care, start from A, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay, so now you're sitting remotely somewhere and uh, you have uh, you are the only uh, medical doctor working there and you uh, there is a burn patient coming to you in accident and emergency so there is a the specific referral criteria for that patient to be shifted to the burn center sometimes maybe uh, 
the total body surface area is maybe only 1% or 2% of the total body surface area. Uh, the depth, if we talk about the depth of the wounds, maybe it's a, only a superficial partial thickness burn and uh, the only immediate care that is what required by the patient. But sometimes uh, the patients are in uh, swear distress and they have deep or mixed thickness burns, they need fluid resuscitation, the patient is in circulatory shock. So we have generated a referral criteria in which the, uh, if any one of these uh, uh, things in the criteria is present in that patient, then you should uh, and you must refer that patient to the burn center. We'll be discussing it one by one. One is the airway or the inhalation injury. It's very important if um, uh, the inhalation or the airway injuries are most commonly suspected with the head, neck, and face uh, burns, right? So uh, very much important uh, if airway or inhalation injury is involved because you have to, uh, uh, you know, pass the ETT or you have to uh, do a proper cricothyrotomy. So it's very much important that initially provide 100% supplemental oxygen, rescue the patient, and then, uh, then shift it to the burn center for proper definitive treatment. Then um, if the patient is circulatory shock or the TBSA is uh, more than 10%, right? So you have to resuscitate your uh, patient. So fluid requirement is there. Then you have to refer to, uh, uh, to the burn center. Require surgery, uh, like if there is steroidotomy or, you know, uh, the patient may, uh, the patient have mixed thickness or a uh, Full thickness burn and later on may patient may need uh, actually grafting. So in that case, is uh, surgery is a requirement. So you have to uh, transfer that patient to the burn center. Burn on the hand, face, feet, or perineum. They should be referred to the burn center as well. Psychiatric or social background. Why? Because most of the patients they have a suicidal tendency. Psychiatric patients, uh, or if there is a social background, so there is a uh, tendency for these patients. To uh, to you know uh, to to do these harmful things again and again, so they need a proper rehab care. So for that, uh, you have uh, to refer these uh, patients uh, to the burn center. Non-accidental injury. Uh, what do you mean by a non-accidental injury? That means that it maybe it was as a result of the assault. Maybe the maybe the patient is a, a, a burn a victim uh, because of the acid burn, right? And somebody is actually. Uh, doing assault to that patient. So non-accident injuries, they should be, that's a medical legal case. So that should be referred to burn center. Patients at the extremes of the age, uh, because they have less uh, immunity and they're uh, immobile and they have lots and lots of comorbidities as well. So these patients should also be uh, referred to the burn center. And then serious burn sickle. We talk about uh, circulatory shock. We talk about gut ischemia. We talked about uh, the sepsis, okay? We talk about the abdominal compartment syndrome, which is being... Uh, produced as, as a sequelae of the burn. And we also did, uh, talked about the um, respiratory failure. We also talked about the, um, you know, uh, kidney injuries, uh, renal failure. So all these patients who have a serious sequelae of the burn, they should be referred to the burn center for their definitive care. So uh, the second part, we talk about the immediate care of the burn. The second part is assessment of the burn. Uh, very much important uh, because you have to assess the depth and the size of the burn, okay? So there's a crude uh, method, which is called as a palm method. And uh, that's actually um, uh, assessing the size. That's a very uh, crude method. I'll be talking uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, then you have to assess, uh, we talk about size and also the depth. So regarding the size, we talk about the palm method. Uh, that's like if uh, you have to take a paper, you have to uh, take that, uh, put that paper on the palm of the patient and then just mark the boundaries. So almost uh, this whole palm of the patient that would be making about 1% about of the TBSA, right? So what you have to do is like just, um, you know, uh, put that uh, part uh, or the size uh, of the palm of the, that patient to the different parts and then keep on adding and adding. That's a, a crude method. Uh, for assessing the size of uh, the wound. But uh, most of the time, there's a valus rule of nine. So for assessing the size of the uh, wound or the total TBSA, we, what we actually do is we follow the valus rule of nine. So each upper limb you can see here, it's uh, front and back, for, it's, for, uh, it's front 4.5 and back 4.5. So each upper limb is nine, right? 
Each nine nine that, that means uh, if we talk about both the upper limbs front and back that that would be eighteen right. Each lower limb is eighteen. Each lower limb is eighteen. That means if we if we if we, if we are uh, talking about both the lower limbs, so that would be thirty six. Then torso is eighteen. Each abdomen and the chest front back including 18 then head and neck is 9 4.5 from front and 4.5 from back so that's all almost 9 and then uh, there is another 1% for the perineal so all the perineal injuries that would be 1% so that is the valus rule of 9 so what you do let's suppose a patient is coming to you and he has uh, you know, the burn is comprising of upper limb, uh, both the upper limbs and uh, the back, right? Uh, 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 upper back, uh, chest and uh, front and uh, front and uh, back of the chest. Mm -hmm. So what would be the total TBSA if we follow the valus rule of nine? So if we're talking about both the upper limbs, so nine, nine would be 18. Each upper limb is nine. So uh, in our case, it was uh, involving both the upper limbs. So that would be 18. And the chest from front is nine and from back is nine. So that's almost 18, right? So 18, 18, 36. So the total TBSA in case of uh, that particular case would be 36. So that's how uh, you can use the valus rule of nine. And most of the time we are using this rule. Now there is another uh, broader chart, which is London broader chart. And it's also uh, for assessing the size. Um, and it's, uh, you know, age specific, like it's uh, head, thigh and leg. So if the, if you're talking about infant, so it would be nine. And in case of one year, it would be eight for five, five years old child, that would be head would be six for adult head would be three. So that's how uh, you uh, at the end, you just have to uh, sum up all these. But most of the time, we don't use this line and broader chart. Most of the time we use a valid rule of nine, which is more practical and more easy to calculate calculate as compared to this because then you must have this chart in your phone or somewhere display somewhere in the hospital but a valid rule of nine is easy to memorize and that's the most important in clinical practice we are using the valid rule of nine so you must remember uh you should know what is london broader chart but you should uh, you should what you should memorize is valid rule of nine which is important for assessing the size now regarding the assessment of the depth uh there are some, uh, you know, the mechanism of injury actually gives you uh, the assessment of the depth. So in cases of the cattle injuries, uh, they're mostly superficial or there, there can be deep dermal patches as well. So in case of uh, dilute, if uh, there is an acid burn, so if the acid is diluted, that would be a superficial burn. And if the, if the acid is concentrated, mostly it's a deep dermal burn. So then uh, these uh, skull injuries, they are deep dermal burns. Then you have uh, the this um, hot water will also lead to the deep dermal or full thickness burns. Fire results in mixed uh, deep or full thickness burn. And then electric burns, they are also most of the time they're full thickness burn. So actually the mechanism of injury is important. You, whenever you're assessing the patient, always ask how uh, the burn was being produced. It was it was electric burn, it was by acid, it was a kettle burn, it was by uh, boiling hot water, it was a fire burn. A mechanism of injury is very important in assessing the depth. Now, third important thing is a definitive treatment care. Definitive treatment care is like, uh, you know, resuscitating your patient, uh, volume resuscitation, fluid resuscitation, and then, uh, uh, you know, preventing septicemia in your patient. And at the end, uh, definitive surgical treatment is also very much important. So in a hospital premises, you start from a primary survey. We already talked about the primary survey, airway, breathing, circulation, uh, disability. Then we talk about the environmental factors. We talk about the exposure and the fluid resuscitation. Adequate analgesia is very important uh, because a patient can have, uh, you know, neuropathic uh, shock as well, neurogenic shock because of the pain. Some patients are so, so in so much in pain that they develop a neurogenic shock. So analgesia is very much important. Some uh, in in uh, some cases you have to provide acute analgesia in the form of the uh, you know IV analgesics, and then later on uh, you have to uh, you know uh, switch them to the oral medications. Fluid resuscitation is important. Ischerotomy is a part of the definitive care because if ischar is formed, there's no other treatment 
other than hysterectomy, then you have to perform a definitive surgery. Uh, psychological uh, rehabilitation of the patient is very much important because mostly patients also go into a post-traumatic stress disorder, which is called the PTSD. So the involvement of psychologist and a psychiatrist is very, very much important if you want to uh, rehabilitate your patient and mentally uh, ease out your patient uh, along with the physical uh, distress. And energy and a balance, energy balance and nutrition is very much important because there is lots, lots and lots of um, you know, loss of the proteins. So it's important uh, to, uh, you know, provide with the sufficient nutrition. We also talked about uh, gut ischemia and uh, decreased mortality of the gut and decreased absorption of the food. So that's, it's important that initially you have to put the patient on IV medication or uh, IV um, uh, nutrition, or sometimes you have to put your patient on um, NG feeding. Primary survey, already talked about airway, breathing, circulation, uh, definite care. Second thing is analgesia, providing uh, acute analgesia and subacute analgesia, uh, initially treating your patient with IV medication. And then if the pain is responding uh, and it's a decrease in severity uh, in subsequent days, then you can shift uh, to the oral medications. Then fluid resuscitation, Flu in the fluid resuscitation, Type of the fluid is very much important. So we have actually uh, uh, hypertonic uh, fluids, we have colloids and we have crystalloids, right? So mostly uh, crystalloids is like ringer lactate, lactated ringers are most commonly used in our trauma patients or uh, burn victims. Then you have a hypertonic uh, saline. In case of these uh, burn patient, there is a chance that they may develop hyponatremia. So um, for that, uh, you can give a hypertonic saline that would be actually uh, dealing with a hyponatremic crisis. And a colloid resuscitation, uh, you have human albumin uh, and there are different um, formulas for calculation of the uh, colloid fluids and for the crystallite solution. So well, most commonly, uh, this human albumin solution is used as a colloid and ringer is used as a crystallite and hypertonic saline can also be used. For the calculation of the colloids, you have this uh, Muir and Barclay formula, uh, which is basically 0.5 into total body surface area burn into weight of the patient is equal to one portion. Now, what do you mean by one portion and how you are going to give that one portion to the patient? So whatever the uh, total body surface area you have calculated by the Wallace rule of nine, multiply it with the weight and multiply it with 0.5. So whatever comes is one portion of the fluid, okay? That one portion of the colloid fluid. Now, initially you have to give that one portion four hours apart, every four hourly, okay? For every four hourly, three times, four hourly, four hourly, four hourly. Then that particular portion, six hourly, right? Like initially you were going, you were giving uh, four hours apart, uh, three times, and then six hours apart, two times, and then 12 hours apart, each portion of that colloid uh, uh, fluid that you have calculated by Muir and Barclay formula. Uh, one portion in each period, already talked about that. The other uh, is the Pocklin formula, which is most, most commonly used for the crystallite solutions. And it is total body surface area, which you have calculated by the uh, Pocklin, uh, by the Wallis rule of nine, then weight and multiply by four. So whatever uh, the answer would be, that would be the total volume. So that would be the total volume for 24 hours. Half of that volume should be replaced in the first eight hours and the remaining half of the volume that should be replaced in the next 16 hours. So that means if the volume is calculated to be, let's suppose 2000, so uh, 2000 ml uh, or the two liters. So one liter would be given in the first eight hours and uh, the remaining one liter should be given in the next 16 hours. So uh, that's how the volume is calculated by using the Parkland formula. But remember it is for the uh, uh, crystallite solutions. For the colloids, we use a, a mirror and the Barclay formula we have already discussed. Okay, regarding the definitive treatment care, uh, especially for those wounds in which there is ischar formation, right? So what you do is like uh, you go for ischarotomy and uh, uh, there are different uh, planes in which you have to perform the ischarotomy for the upper limb, for the lower limb, for the hands. Uh, you have to follow the proper uh, 
guidelines while performing the hysterotomy. So this is a very uh, nice diagram, which is actually telling you where to perform the hysterotomy in the upper limb and the lower limb. So most of the time you can see here that uh, this is mid-axial almost, uh, uh, it's uh, mid-axial and you have actually, uh, you have to perform the strotomies in the different compartments, right? So in case of the upper limb, it's mid-axial and you have to uh, follow proper plane uh, because medially you have the ulnar nerve. So if you are performing a mid-axial, you have to go a little bit of uh, the lateral over here and you have to go all the way, then you have to come back medially and all the way to the palm, almost uh, the middle of the palm. So if you uh, go down and you could uh, appreciate here, then uh, almost uh, you are also performing a lateral and a medial hysterotomy and you have to follow uh, the uh, obviously the meaning vinyl line and uh, you have to follow that plane all the way. So in the upper limbs, it's mid-axial and you have to save the uh, ulnar nerve here. And in the lower limb, there is a lateral and a medial hysterotomy, which is being performed uh, for the medial and the lateral uh, compartment of the leg. Uh, on the chest, you can see here, uh, you are performing uh, the, in different plans, uh, you're performing the hysterotomies. On hand, it's uh, involving the digits, uh, the mid palmar spaces, okay, or the mid dorsal spaces of the hand. Uh, in case of the dorsum and the palmar aspect of the hand, uh, you have to follow the interdigital, middle of the interdigital space. Uh, we talk about the physiological uh, rehabilitation because patients have this if they recover from the acute injury and if they have recovered from the acute phase and a definitive uh, uh, care treatment hysterotomy has been performed, uh, they actually uh, go through uh, a physiological phase as well, psychological and uh, depressive stage. So rehabilitation for the post-traumatic stress disorder is very much important. Energy imbalance nutrition, uh, already talked about if the patient, most of the cases uh, in acute burn, the patient is unable uh, to eat. So you have to put uh, uh, the NG tube or uh, which is uh, the nasogastric uh, uh, tube for uh, the feeding, or you have to, uh, plus you have to give the extra uh, calories because you know that there is a fluid shifting and the patient may develop shock. So you have to re resuscitate the patient with a fluid and a good energy and nutrition balance is important because because there is a loss of the proteins as well. So if there's a greater than 15% of the TBSA, NG tube uh, should be placed. And uh, uh, for, uh, for actually stopping the catalytic uh, drive, you have, uh, you have to stop the catalytic drive if you want uh, the burn uh, to be healed. So extra feeding, NG tube, parenteral nutrition, total parenteral nutrition, they all are very important for the energy balance and nutrition. In case of the uh, full thickness burn, initially, if uh, even if even if the if you're talking about superficial or mixed thickness burn, if the patient is initially coming to you, so starting from the pre-hospital care, then in the hospital care, there is a special uh, option for the topical ointment. So we use a one percent sulfur, sulfa, diazine cream, or uh, there there are also solutions which are available in the formation of 0.5 percent sulfur nitrate. Uh, Mefenide acetate cream can also be used. Serum nitrate, sulfur, sulfa, diazine and cerium nitrate cream, these all can be used as a topical treatment. Most commonly in our setting, we are using this one person sulfur, uh, sulfadiazine uh, cream uh, initially. Uh, plus, um, there is the proper uh, regimen to follow uh, for addressing. The dressing of a burn wound is very much important. Either it's a superficial burn, uh, it's a partial thickness, uh, superficial partial thickness burn, or a mixed thickness burn. Dressing of the, uh, uh, the, the that particular wound should be done in layers. Now, initially, you have to layer the wound uh, with that particular topical agent, mostly 1% sulfur, silver sulfadiazine, uh, uh, cream and uh, first of all let's suppose you have this um wound on the palm of the hand. So first, initially, what you have to do is you have to apply the sulfur, silver, silver sulfadiazine uh, cream, then the paraffin gauze, uh, then above that, actually these, uh, if you, um, uh, piedine soaked paraffin gauze, if, if this is available in your setting, and if you if that's not available, then just take the simple paraffin gauze, dip it in a piedine solution, and then play, place it just over the uh, over the ointment. Uh, then uh, place a simple, simple gauze, 
uh, simple wet gauze and then the dry gauze and then above that you have a carton and then you have a crepe bandage so these are the layers of addressing it's very much important to memorize this because it's uh, not only uh, giving you giving a protection to the skin but also uh, help minimizing this uh, the chances of sepsis in that patient so this is very much important uh, also uh, you know uh, uh, continue treating your patient with the iv antibiotics and continue treating your patient with iv fluid and resuscitation and according to the formula and the tbsa but dressing uh, is very much important which is a simple dressing most of the time in acute burns we use this this kind of a dressing then uh, for those uh, wounds which are basically mixed thickness and uh, the epidermis is gone, the dermis is gone, right? And uh, you know that uh, you know that almost uh, uh, the healing or the regeneration of the skin is not possible. For that cases, you do a grafting, which is a uh, you know uh, mostly we we do. Uh, uh, partial thickness graft or a full thickness graft most of the time uh, the uptake of the partial thickness graft is very very much uh, very very much uh, good and uh, the prognosis is excellent so in that case uh, for initially you would be treating uh, on the lines of uh, simple dressing and IV fluid resuscitation and uh, you know uh, the antibiotics and everything so when the wound uh, there is a sufficient granulation tissue and the wound is okay it's free of sepsis there are no chances of in fact there are no uh, signs of infection uh, over that wound then you have to graft prepare the wound for the grafting and do a definitive grafting depending upon uh, the uh, site and size of the wound so that's all for today. Uh, in this particular lecture, uh, we have discussed about uh, almost, um, as in, in a simpler way, we try to discuss about uh, the wounds, uh, the management, the pathophysiology, the definitive and the initial uh, definitive uh, treatment plans for the burn patient. So that's all for uh, today. Keep watching Scardia.com.